The Donnelly Weston Research Fellowship Grant helps advance the careers of future nephrology leaders who will combine the highest levels of achievements with the highest standards of professionalism. In this podcast, Dr. Donald E. Wesson interviews Dr. Nicholas Wang about his research in clinical transplant nephrology and the science of translational immunology. Welcome to the ASN Kidney News Podcast. Dr. Wang, would you mind introducing yourself to our listeners? Hi, I'm Nicholas Wang. I am uh, currently a nephrology, a transplant nephrology fellow um, at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and previously have uh, been a general nephrology fellow in the laboratory of Lawrence Turka at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Wonderful. And Dr. Wesson, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, I'm Donald E. Wesson. I am currently the chief academic officer at Baylor Scott & White Health in Dallas, Texas. That position puts me over both research and education enterprises in our system. I'm a nephrologist also. I've spent most of my career in research, uh, originally trained in the University of Illinois uh, Chicago program under my mentor, Dr. Neil Kurtzman. That's great. Well, welcome to the Kidney News Podcast. Dr. Wang, what made you apply for the Donald E. Wesson Research Fellowship Program? Well, I absolutely fell in love with uh, transplant nephrology as a general nephrology fellow. And I first fell in love with clinical transplant nephrology, um, getting patients off dialysis rather than uh, maintaining patients on dialysis. Um, And then as I dug deeper into clinical transplant nephrology, I really grew to uh, fall in love with the science and translational immunology. I found a wonderful mentor in uh, Dr. Larry Turka, um, who was doing just that, is is, uh, translational immunology, and he offered me the opportunity to really start studying human immunology in a way that could be meaningful for uh, the care of transplant patients. Um, So I applied for the Donald E. Wesson uh, um, uh, postdoctoral fellowship so that I could really pursue those interests in the lab and gain the research skills that I would need to be able to do translational human immunobiology uh, so that I could provide ultimately not only clinical care but very academically oriented um, research care to advance, uh, to advance the care of our, pa- our renal transplant patients. Well, Dr. Zwang, um, first of all, I am honored to have you be the recipient of a fellowship that uh, I'm pleased to have uh, named in my honor. And I certainly would like to get more into the details of your research, which I find fascinating. But but I must say, though, uh, Jessica sent me a, a copy of your CV, and one of the things that stood out to me in an effort to try to get to know you better is the fact that you were a history major in undergraduate uh, school, and I just am curious as to how a history major developed an interest in medicine. Um, Well, sure. So um, in some very unexpected ways, I think, um, I I really started out in college knowing that I was interested in going to medical school because I really loved biology, Um, but I wanted to get more out of my college experience than just studying biology, which I, I ultimately did all of my required organic chemistry classes and and uh, physics and those kinds of things and enjoyed that, but also really de- had a deep love for the humanities and really wanted to have the humanities be a real central part of my academic experience in college. I wanted to read great books and and read what great thinkers had to say and uh, and really fell in love with history. And what I did in uh, one of the my, my focus in history was called uh, intellectual history or sort of the history of ideas. And I had wonderful teachers there who really taught me how to think. And um, and I believe that really learning how to think is so critical for taking care of patients, for science and for medicine. And those kinds of skills as part of a liberal education really have served me in, in fantastic stead as I've moved along in my career. So uh, I remember very clearly working with uh, one of my very favorite professors, whose name is Alan Kors, at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, and we took history seminars with him. And one of the things that we would do was read, they would be different themes, 17th century, uh, 17th century intellectual history, history where we'd read, uh, where we'd read Descartes and Newton 
and and try to read great thinkers in their own words. And the test questions would always be about not do you agree or disagree with the people that you've read or or things like that. They would all they would always be can you reconstruct an argument, a very technical philosophical argument. Can you can you reconstruct this argument on paper? And um, the skills that I really learned there were to understand things and to really uh, check myself to be able to, that whatever I'm reading to make sure I really understand it and that I really engage with it. And in that case, it was it was great texts and great intellectual works. But I think it's sort of the same idea when you read a scientific paper um, before you agree or disagree with what an author might say is to really try to understand um, what's going on in something that you read. And those are skills I think of from a liberal education that have been really essential for me in, uh, in, in what I do clinically and in research. Well, Dr. Wang, I don't know if you know, but you are following the, the trail that's been blazed by some of the giants in nephrology. I'm thinking of uh, Homer Smith and Robert Pitts, but there are many others. These are uh, individuals who certainly were uh, uh, skilled scientists, but they also were broadly educated uh, men who brought much of the thinking from different disciplines to their science. And so it's impressive to hear you speak in a way that you have just spoken and that that broad, I would say, liberal arts education I think is, has, has stood you well in terms of your science because, as you very well uh, noted, it gives you the opportunity to bring the, the thinking uh, and the strategic approach to problem solving that comes from multiple areas. And so I think that has served and will continue to serve your scientific career uh, well going forward. Thank you very much. And, you know, I, I realize one of the other things that my liberal education has taught me is, is really how to write. And um, people in the humanities at Penn were, were very uh, – I, I was very fortunate to have really excellent uh, writing teachers. And one of them, uh, my first – semester of college made me sit down with Strunk and White and, and really learn, and, and, and we tore apart one of my very first term papers and, and rewrote it to, to really make my prose understandable, and that experience really struck with me, and I think I write um, in, in now in a way that, that I, 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 I learned to do as an undergraduate and that I learned to do in the humanities. So I think one of the things that still makes me shiver a little bit is whenever I'm writing uh, a paper and I'm writing in... Uh, um, writing uh, uh, in, rather in, in a passive rather than an active voice it still makes me shiver a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but that's the style. <laughs> well, uh, very nice. Um, so I'm I'm just thrilled that that uh, your scientific pursuits led you to within medicine led you to nephrology. So can you give us some insight that, as to what about nephrology attracted you? Sure. I think the first, the, the experience that I had in nephrology uh, was first as a medical student. And as a medical student, I had the opportunity to take a year away from med school to do a Howard Hughes program at uh, the NIH. And in, uh, unfortunately, the program is no longer in existence. It was the NIH Cloisters program. And um, it was really a fantastic program where 30 other medical students uh, joined in, took a year off from medical school. They were they had finished their second, or in my case, third year of medical school. And everyone went to the NIH campus and sort of lived a life of science without any expectation of what, would, of what they would study. It was just that they had to have some interest in basic or translational science. And, and uh, the idea was that everyone would go to the NIH and find a lab and actually go through the process of, of identifying mentors, which was a valuable uh, process in and of itself. And ultimately, I found a nephrology lab, not because I was looking for a nephrology lab, but just because I found the mentor that I met very compelling, uh, Mark Knepper, who is, um, I didn't know at the time, and now I know is very well known in aquaporin trafficking and proteomics work. And I found him just, not, just to be a compelling person, to be somebody who really cared about mentoring and, and helping me to have a great experience in science. And so I joined his lab for that reason, um, but I really loved nephrology after working with him, and it was a great experience for a medical student under working with aquaporin trafficking because that water balance is one of the one of the, the keystones of nephrology. So I really had that, that experience of, of trying to understand water balance and, and, and uh, the, the very basic aspects of, of how the kidneys work. Um, 
And then when I went back to medical school, I did a nephrology rotation where I saw all of that basic science in action with patients, and that just cinched it for me. It was able to see how what we did at the bench actually related to what happened at the bedside and uh, and, and thought about how uh, about how aquaporins and vasopressin can be turned off and on, and, and that really just did it for me to be able to see the, the relationship between the science and the actual medicine. Again, it's interesting that your experience that you describe um, uh, mimics that of many of us and I'm sure many other colleagues And that in addition to the science, in addition to the interest in, in, in physiology, there were often individuals that, uh, that led to our interest. You've mentioned two, uh, Dr. Turka and Dr. Nepper, um, and you've touched on it a little bit, but uh, can you expand a little bit about how these and possibly other individuals themselves have led to your interest in research and nephrology in addition to your interest in the science? Sure. Um, well, Dr. Turka has been really a, my most recent mentor and has really been a fantastic mentor to me. And one of the things that was really special about working in his lab for me that, that started out as a, a, a little bit frightening to me but wound up being fantastic is that I was in, in my current, in, in that lab, I was, aside from Dr. Turka, the only MD in the lab. And one of the things that was really special was everyone else was working with mice and I had a strong interest in working with human samples and so we developed some, we, we developed protocols and a, and a platform for working with, uh, in, in the case of my project, with human samples from normal individuals and then we branched out into a side project working with samples from cancer patients, which turned out to be a really interesting side project. Um, but Dr. Turker really gave me that latitude to try something new from what everyone else was doing in the lab to be able to develop the skills that I knew I wanted to develop so that I could ultimately advance on my own in, in, um, in translational immunology. So we, he had some very particular interests about P3 kinase signaling and regulatory T cells in the, mi in the mouse, and, and he was interested on, on it, was a, it was a good um, meeting of the minds, I think, that he was interested in whether or not some of the mouse data actually translated to human, and I was interested in taking human samples and learning how to study human samples in the lab. Uh, and as I say, developing some of those skills. So he really uh, he, he he gave me those that that opportunity to be able to develop those skills and those interests. And in the past couple of uh, and during my my time in clinical transplant nephrology, I've also really started to advance some of my own uh, clinical interests and in and think about how I might want to take those back into the lab. Um, I think that so that's that that's been really one of the fantastic things about working with uh, Dr. Turka. Um, looking back in, at, at how I uh, worked with, uh, uh, at, at some of my experiences with Dr. Nepper, uh, in addition to, you know, we, we in, in his lab, we were taking rat intermedullary collecting duct cells and we were doing proteomics and looking for binding partners to aquaporins that might be involved in trafficking of the molecule. Um, and some of the things that we, we thought about were how we could, some of the things that, that we thought about were, were development of assays, and he really gave me a lot of uh, opportunity to develop assays and think about how I would develop them and how I would interpret results once I got them. And we had a lot of conversations as the year went along about kind of the value of doing a test and, and how to think about if we do a test or do an experiment, what would be the result, how we think about the result, would it change the next things that we would do. And that ultimately, we, we, we thought a lot about how that, that related to patient care, about ordering tests, whether a test that we would order might actually impact a, something that we would do to take care of the patient. And particularly as we thought about water balance and and uh, and and hyponatremia, and we had a lot of conversations as the year went along there. So he, he built a lot of those clinical correlates for me. I remember we had some interesting discussions um, in the year about about runners and vasopressin conditioning um, and why runners um, who, who condition themselves to, uh, to, to uh, uh, be a little bit dehydrated as they go along their training might be less apt to develop hyponate, acute life-threatening hyponatremia um, because they're, they're not... Uh, um, because they're not inserting as much vasopressin in their, in, into their uh, distal tubules um, as they would if they, if they were completely uh, unconditioned. 
So we, I, I, I thought through uh, with Dr. Nepper, we really spent a lot of time thinking about clinical correlates and parallels to what we were doing in the lab and to just thinking about some of the basics, about how to be a good uh, a good scientist and, and how to interpret data and results. And then I think with Dr. Turco, really, a lot of what I got to do was develop my own set of skills that were different from what everyone else in the lab was doing and, and develop some of that individuality. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. And uh, one of the things that I hope that you have learned in that experience with these two individuals, and I'm sure others, how important it is that the individual to individual mentoring, senior scientist to a more junior scientist, how important that is in developing individual careers and how important that is to nephrology overall. And I encourage you to do the same with younger and less experienced scientists with whom and physicians with whom that you would come in contact um, uh, going forward because that's how the profession and the science therein continues uh, to spread and continue to grow. So I encourage you to do the same that, that those two individuals and others have done for you. Thank you. And, and I'm, I I'm definitely hope to be able to do that, and, and that's something I really enjoy doing is, is having conversations about uh, with people on our team, with residents and, fel and, and younger fellows about about the science and, and how science uh, can, how how well, what we what we know scientifically reflects what we're doing at the bedside. And I should add a, a, a talk about another mentor to me actually, um, who is um, uh, who is uh, Dr. Mark Seidel, um, who I've had uh, one of the uh, had the opportunity to work with when I was back in medical school after my experience. Uh, I, I, I uh, think of them as the Marks. There was Mark Nepper and Mark Seidel. And after I got back to uh, medical school from my experience with Mark Nepper, I took the, the work that I had done and we, we finished a manuscript and published the manuscript and also um, based uh, using that work wrote a medical school honors thesis and that was advised by Dr. Zidel. And I had some equally really fantastic experiences working with him and, and, um, and uh, most recently about a year ago now or maybe a year and a half ago now had the opportunity to uh, spend a week at Mount Desert Island with him learning renal physiology. And one of the things that was so striking is just how the, phys the renal physiology can come alive when you're measuring your own creatinine and, and measuring your own water balance um, compared to just reading things in a textbook. And he's had, and, and working with him um, on uh, a, a little more clinically, um, and he's very interested in education, has really been an inspiration too. I, I think that that uh, we that that having that exposure to some hands-on things and, and seeing how the hands-on uh, experiences and, and measuring your own uh, your own electrolytes or measuring flux of of, uh, of uh, electricity off of turtle bladder epithelium actually um, plays out in real life. You can better understand things like uh, things like sodium excretion and acid base balance. Um, so I, I also owe a lot to Dr. Zidel. Well, very good. Well, as, as I said, that's that's a wonderful testimonial about the importance of, of mentoring, and we'll ask you to to pass that on as as you go forward in your career. Absolutely. You know, I, uh, Dr. Zwang, I'm always curious about uh, talented scientists like yourself, how they find their ways into particular uh, research areas within nephrology. I guess we can broadly classify your interest in that into transplant and uh, uh, transplant uh, medicine and immunology. I'm sure part of that had to do with your having developed a relationship with uh, Dr. Turka, but can you tell us some other aspects about transplant nephrology that interest you and, and, and give you a passion to pursue it? Sure. I think that there there are a, the, the, the two arms of, of what we do. I think transplant nephrology in general or transplantation is a very science-heavy field and a very translational field by its very nature. And uh, one of my mentors here at Northwestern, Lorenzo Gallone, I'll, I'll crib from him and say that all of the diseases in transplantation are diseases that we've made because our ancestors, our, our, our cave people ancestors, did not have transplantation. So any disease that we have is, is a human-made disease in transplantation, which is kind of a striking idea to me. And 
presumably if all the diseases are diseases that we've made, then all of them are diseases that are solvable. And I think what's been very striking about my clinical experience in transplantation is chronic antibody-mediated rejection, both acute and chronic, but particularly chronic antibody-mediated rejection. And I've taken care of, uh, as a transplant nephrology fellow this past year, I've taken care of dozens of patients who have creatinines, who, who had great, great transplants coming in and, and now maybe five, six years out have a, have a creatinine that's hanging out in the twos and mid twos and creeping up to the threes and we biopsy them and we see changes of, kind of chronic uh, glomerulopathy and they have maybe a donor-specific antibody. Some of them maybe have been treated in the past for antibody-mediated rejection. And it really is intellectually frustrating to me that we don't have very much to offer those patients. We try to control proteinuria and blood pressure and all the typical things that we know um, are, are beneficial for a transplant. But we always have in the back of our heads, um, and, and I think sometimes express to our patients, that the disease that we see, you know, and chronic antibody, mediated rejection is something that we can slow, but we're never going to stop. And I think that makes me really sad about transplantation and just is, is how, um, how few tools we have to treat that particular disease process. Um, when we see cell-mediated rejection, we have all sorts of chemotherapies, and we use thymoglobulin or CAMPATH or steroids, um, but our tools are so limited for antibody-mediated rejection, and I think part of our tools being very limited, um, that's a reflection of our knowledge about B-cell biology and, and antibody-mediated uh, rejection being very limited, too. So I think having had that experience has really inspired me to want to pursue better ways to treat an uh, antibody-mediated rejection and, and understand B-cell biology in particular. So those are some of the interests that I've been developing lately based on my clinical experiences. You know, Dr. Swang, it is, it's wonderful to hear you talk about the science and the way that you are, are doing so. It reminds me of one of the important lessons that I learned from my uh, main mentor uh, during my fellowship, Dr. Neil Kurtzman. He always talked about making sure that the science, no matter how deductive it gets, that you always continue to connect it to clinical medicine because we are physicians who... Um, happen to be uh, researchers, but we're not researchers who happen to be physicians. So that's something he, he constantly uh, uh, told me, to continue to make that, comp that connection between the, the science, the deductive science and the clinical medicine. So can you help us in your thinking how you are continuing to make that, that connection between your research and what you do as a physician? Sure. Well, I think that there are a lot of things that need to, to intersect um, for somebody to really, what I hope, be successful in, uh, in, as, as a physician scientist. And I think the first is to have some, some basic tools that you know how to use to, to uh, investigate things. And I think a lot of those tools I've really learned with Dr. Turka is basic, the, the, the basic language of, of immunology and the basic uh, tools and skill sets. So I think that it's not enough just to be able to identify a problem, um, but to be able to think about, okay, how, how would I start to address this problem? How would I study this problem? And then to be able to go back into the literature and actually read a little bit about what other people are doing, think about what other people could be doing, and, and think about the kinds of tools that either I have that, are, that, that I could use to start uh, addressing a problem or the, the tools that I might need to learn. And uh, an, uh, another mentor once told me that in, uh, in science you should always be fearless with methods. So I always like the idea of learning new methods to be able to address the questions that I might have. But I think it's really important for me, as I've been thinking about some of these problems about B-cell biology and antibody-mediated reje rejection, is uh, as, as I go back in the literature, I think, okay, well, what are the kinds of what are the kinds of tools I would need if I were to try to ask some questions about B-cell biology and about antibody-mediated rejection? What are the kinds of, if, if you had unlimited resources and unlimited time, what are some ways you might study these sorts of things and how have other people studied them? So I think that, that having some of those tools and being able to then go back in the literature and, and build your own knowledge about of, of the basic science um, and, and stack that up against the clinical experience 
is really important, and, and that's why it takes these, I think, two, uh, th these two streams of, of clinical training and research training to come together um, to Great. be able to be successful in helping patients. Great, and I agree 100%, and, and, and I like the way you've outlined it. Uh, so I, I really would like to, to understand more the details of the project for which you received the fellowship, but um, let me ask, uh, with respect to phosphatidyl 3 kinase inhibition in, rec in regulatory T cells, how did you get to asking the question that you're asking? So can you give us a short synopsis of your research thus far that led to this particular question, then we can get into the details of what you'll do. Sure, absolutely. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll um, maybe if, if I can start at the end for a second, uh, fortunately we were just able, to, uh, our, uh, about a week ago, our uh, revised paper was just accepted for publication at AJT, so I'm thrilled that uh, that the paper is about to come out and, and we've we, uh, we we had some really what I think are interesting findings. Congratulations! That's a big step forward. Thank you. Um, so th there's a lot. There's a fair amount of data from from uh, mouse cells, from mouse biology, and um, that that came before me. That was was part of the lab. And the the project when when uh, Dr. Turkin and I first sat down together, um, he he brought up some of the very interesting findings in mouse, which I'll. I'll uh, mention in, a, in, a, in some broad brush strokes. And uh, the question that he had was, how might some of this relate to human? And um, and, and then I, the, the, that was sort of the broad brush strokes of the project that he had in mind, and then I really ran with that to try to put things together. And of course, the mentorship involved helping me to craft the project and craft the questions and experimental um, approaches. And the, um, the sort of big picture is that PI3 kinase signaling is, of course, very important in many different mammalian cells. It's a, it's a critical pathway sur for survival and proliferation in many cells, and uh, that's uh, particularly true in, uh, in white blood cells. And uh, very interestingly, um, T cell, the activation of the T cell receptor um, in, uh, in, in, well, T cells, in, in all T cells, really seems one of the critical pathways, the downstream activation pathways of T cell receptor activation is PI3 kinase signaling, along with some other pathways. Now, there's some MAP kinase signaling too, but PI3 kinase signaling is very critical for integrating stimulation of the T cell receptor um, and downstream ultimately into survival and proliferation of T cells. And, um, and kind of surprisingly, it seems that um, in regulatory T cells, uh, the T, uh, PI3 kinase signaling, rather than beneficial as they are in effector T cells, PI3 there's mouse there, there's a fair amount of mouse evidence to suggest that PI3 kinase signaling is actually damaging uh, to regulatory T cells or, or or suppresses the function of regulatory T cells sometimes and maybe putting putting the brakes on the brakes as it were. And there's a, a mouse model that a number of different labs have worked with in which uh, P10, which is the major counter-regulatory phosphatase to PF3 kinase signaling, is knocked out in regulatory T cells. So normally PF3 kinase signaling promotes um, downstream activation via AKT and, and uh, exclusion of FOXOs from the nucleus. Um, PF3 kinase signaling, uh, 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 PF3 kinase overactivity, I should say, um, can be enforced by P10, act, uh, by, by P10 deletion. So if, if PI3 kinase activates uh, phosphorylation from PIP2 to PIP3 in cells, um, P10 dephosphorylates PIP3 back to PIP2. And in uh, on this mouse model, when P10 is conditionally deleted in FOXP3 positive, those are the regulatory T cells, these mice go on to develop very severe autoimmunity, actually, um, they develop a severe glomerulonephritis, which is kind of interesting. Um, but they also fail to resolve a number of, of, uh, of, of autoimmune insults. They fail to resolve autoimmune encephalomyelitis, and they lose some stability of their regulatory T cell lineage. So there's, there's some evidence, a fair amount of evidence in mouse cells that when PI3 kinase signaling is enforced, are overactivated with deletion of P10 that mice go on to develop severe autoimmunity 
lymphoproliferative disease and lineage instability of their regulatory T cells. And um, we wanted to know if the, the same was true in human cells. And um, it was very good timing that there are a number of PS3 kinase inhibitors that are very hot in clinical oncology. And so we developed a, uh, a collaboration with Novartis, some of that had been in the works before I came into the lab, um, that we developed a clinical collaboration with Novartis to test a number of uh, PS3 kinase inhibitors that were starting to be used in oncology. And they were starting to be used not for the, the same purposes that we were thinking of, um, but because PI3 kinase um, can be, the PI3 kinase overexpression is found in a lot of tumors, um, particularly a number of uh, lymphoproliferative diseases. So those, those uh, specific inhibitors for some very specific isoforms of PI3 kinase were developed uh, for, were, were, were in, in, uh, phase three, some, some in, in phase two, phase three clinical trials, and we developed this materials transfer agreement with Novartis. So um, it was some good timing that we had some a very, what we thought was a very interesting clinical uh, research question that we wanted to translate from mouse to human cells, and we also had some very specific tools to be able to do that. And so then the question that we asked was what would be the effects of PI3 kinase inhibition in regulatory T cells compared to effector T cells. So those are, that's some of the background. Well, uh, that's very exciting, and it certainly will lead to a question I want to ask uh, later on. But let me ask now, so where do you plan to take the research uh, from here once you've completed the, uh, the studies for which the fellowship is, is, uh, is funding? Sure. So um, some of the basic findings, I should first say, when we started to ask this question, where we really tried to nail down were some of the differential effects between of PI3 kinase signaling and inhibition of PI3 kinase in regulatory versus effector T cells. And, and I should add that we had some further evidence that there's differential reliance on PI3 kinase signaling in regulatory versus effector cells. And we developed a number of assays to actually test it, and we, we found that, indeed, that uh, effector T cells were a whole lot more susceptible to PI3 kinase inhibition than regulatory T cells were. And we analyzed that both in terms of proliferation and activation and even a little bit of signaling. There really seemed to be some preferential effect of PI3 kinase inhibition on the effector T cells compared to the regulatory T cells. And that's, that's some of a long story short, I think, about the, the uh, results of, of the experiments. I think that some of the things that are worthwhile thinking about now, and, and I know some of the collaborators uh, around that, uh, some of the, the collaborators that we have worked with are interested in how that might bear out in vivo. Um, so all of this work has been in vitro. And the next things to think about is how these, this kind of work would bear out in an in vivo model, in a transplant model, either in mouse or in a large animal, and um, potentially with the, the long-term goal of seeing whether that might be helpful in humans. That's, um, that's particularly with regard to transplantation. Now, sure. aside, well, aside from – oh, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, first of all, I just commend you on that collaboration. Um, certainly, it, as you're learning, collaboration is, is something that is certainly helpful to uh, everybody that's involved, and it just multiplies the science uh, expon explan exponentially. So I, I commend you on, on uh, doing that collaboration and involving others in the, in the good science that you guys are doing in your own laboratory. Thank you. And, and I think we even found that in our own lab is, and, and I found that in, in my personal experience too, is it's, it, it, it's so important to be able to involve multiple sets of eyes. And rather than one person um, trying to do every assay on their own perfectly, sometimes you find that, it, that sometimes some assays can be, better develop, can be better run by somebody else who has a little more expertise. And that's that's not a reason not to understand the assay. It's a reason to understand it, but to realize that somebody else might have more expertise in running a particular set of exper experiments. And we found that as we, as we were looking at things like cytokines, that, that we relied on collaboration uh, to analyze some cytokine expression from the, from the supernatants of our, our samples, our culture samples, that we, we probably could have spent a lot 
lot of time trying to hit our heads against the wall, trying to work out the assays and perfect the assays. But there were collaborators who we could work with that, that were better able to answer those questions than we were, and, and, we had, uh, and, and I think we all benefited from working together on that. Absolutely, including your collaborators benefiting from working with, with you and the others in your lab. Right. So we talked earlier about the importance of connecting our basic research with clinical medicine. So can you give us some insights as to how you think that your research being supported by the, the, the fellowship is going to help clinicians in the future? Sure. Well, some of that, I should say, um, actually involves, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a roundabout way, I think, of, of, of answering that question, if you don't mind. Sure. One of, the, one of the side projects that developed out of the experiments, and um, this is, that, and, and is still ongoing, so I can't give too much in the way of details, um, but one of the side projects that developed is we collaborated with an oncology group and started to look at, at, samples from, at, at patient samples from them. And they had some particular clinical questions about what the effects of their drugs might be, and we started to try to analyze those in the lab. And um, that was sort of later on in the, in, into the fellowship, after I think I had laid the groundwork for myself of developing a lot of the, tool, of the basic tools, being able to do flow cytometry, put together good panels for flow cytometry, do mechanistic studies, put together some assays. And then I had this really interesting opportunity um, to take some patient samples and start to answer some questions from those patient samples and sort of devise, devise my own assays um, from the beginning there. And even though the, the, the experiments and studies are still ongoing for those, um, what I really what I really found was that I had this great set of tools to be able to answer to, to be able to ask and answer some really worthwhile questions from patient samples, and ultimately that's sort of how I see myself moving forward as a translational um, scientist, as somebody who's very interested in taking what we see at the bedside and translating that into in, into the bench, what we can do at the bench and understand at the bench, and then ultimately back to the patient. And that bridge, are the, I think, is those that are those sets of tools about what we can use with what we can understand from uh, a vial of patient blood, what we can understand about how the immune system is behaving, how different immune cells are functioning or not functioning or interacting. And so I think the, a, a lot of what I learned from the, from the basic experiments, from the, the PI3 kinase signaling experiments, were a lot of those tools that then I gained sort of the skills and confidence to be able to study patient sam real patient samples from this clinical collaboration. And I think that going forward in clinical medicine and translational medicine, those are the kinds of skills that I think I now can use as I start to be able to ask and hopefully answer some of my own questions based on patients that I encounter. Well, Dr. Wayne, this, this has really been fascinating and, and, and just wonderful to hear you, you describe your research. The last question I want to ask is, with regard to the fellowship, how, how would you place it uh, in importance in terms of your career going forward? How do you see the fellowship uh, helping you, um, and um, how might you uh, talk to others in the field about uh, applying for such fellowships in the future? Sure. Uh, well, I think it's been phenomenally important for me, and um, both from a um, it, it, any any grant I think is a is a wonderful ego boost, but I think more more than just that, um, the experience of going through and writing a grant. This was really as I applied for this fellowship. This was the first time I, I went and, and wrote a grant. I had no idea about how to write a grant going into this, and um, I felt at, at the beginning I sort of felt like I was just winging it. And then fortunately, I of course had great mentorship from Dr. Turka, and we really spent a lot of time going over the grant. Um, looking back and, and not only honing my writing, but honing the, my background, background reading, and, and he really helped me to point, point me in the right direction to go through the literature. And we, we really put together what I was really proud of as a grant, and, and I, I was very, very grateful. Um, I was maybe even a little surprised to be funded um, and, and remain very grateful for the funding. Uh, but the, the experience in particular of actually going through and writing that grant was enormously important for me um, because it, it really not only was important for, uh, for 
learning how to put together a grant and actually the nuts and bolts of putting together a grant. But I think that any time you write, it really requires that you really clarify your own ideas and hone your ideas and start to think about them critically and wonder, well, how might somebody else who's reading something that I've written um, think about this? What what questions might they ask? What might they see as a problem? Or what might they see as, as a necessary addition? And I think going through the process of writing that grant very early in the course of my experience with Dr. Turka really helped to set the tone for the next for the rest of the time that I was in the lab because it helped me really cr- to create this roadmap for what I was going to do. And I, I hope that under the best of circumstances, grant writing really is just about that as it helps to as it helps to clarify your own thinking and, and give yourself a roadmap and help to uh, to keep you on track as you're going along. And in, in fact. The, the, some of the very first things I did as I was writing that grant were I sort of mapped out in just a flow sheet on a piece of paper all the different things I was thinking about and how I might go about this kind of road map. And, I, and I, I modified that, of course, as I went along with the grant, but I kept that up on my desk with a, on, on the bulletin board with my desk and sort of thought about that and kind of once a week checked in with it. Am I, am I doing the, the, the things that I thought I would be doing? If I am, you know, how are they, what, how are they turning out? Uh, and, and if I'm not, why am I, I deviating from that? Is it a is it a productive deviation, or am I getting lost? So I think wow, that Dr. you have described what I think many of us, myself included, would be an unanticipated benefit of the fellowship. Certainly, many of us would recognize the benefit of having the funds support your research. But I, I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that just the process of putting the grant together you found very beneficial to your career. I, I absolutely did, and, and of course don't want to diminish it. It was very important um, that it, it allowed me to actually stay on, financially allowed me to stay on, to be able to do my research, and, and was really important in that way from from uh, uh, from a financial standpoint, um, because it's it's uh, particularly as a fellow, it's sometimes very hard to be able to find that that funding and support, and and really made that so that really made things possible um, that I think a lot of Investigators find that uh, that one of the the most uh, most difficult things in their lab is not funding reagents; it's actually funding people. And I think that that really made uh, made that funding of of me as a person possible, so that I could then go on and do the experiments that I wanted to do in in, in the lab. Well, that that's delightful to hear, and I, I'll just say that the ASN has honored me by attaching my name to this this fellowship, and certainly I'm thankful to the ASN for that. But I'm also thankful to you for at least two reasons. First, um, for uh, being a recipient. I think the quality of you as an individual and the quality of your research is certainly an honor to me uh, for your receiving the fellowship that has my name on it. And I, the second reason is, uh, is I'd just like to thank you for the the wonderful conversation that we've just had. I've, I've learned a lot about you, and you've, you've articulated some very important lessons for uh, not just young investigators, but all investigators going forward. And I certainly wish you the best in your career, and I look forward to the great things that are going to come out of not only your lab, but in your leadership in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wesson. I really appreciate your leadership too, and, and your in, uh, and your investing in, uh, in young people like me. Uh, you're more than welcome. So, Jessica, that's about all I got. <laughs> it was perfect. So that's good. <laughs> um, is there anything you guys want to touch base on, like a one-off question or anything like that? Uh, Dr. Um, Zwang, I'll let you go first. If you have anything else you want to add. Yeah, well, I would just be um, interested to hear about uh, some of your mentoring experiences and, and formative experiences uh, with Dr. Kurtzman a little bit more. I, I always find that inspiring to hear how uh, how other people were, were mentored and, and developed. Well, that's a very good question, um, and, and I've alluded to some of it. Um, I must say that uh, when I went into his laboratory, I had my own ideas about the research that I wanted to pursue, uh, but I ended up, which was distinctive from from the acid-base physiology that that he was leading in his laboratory. And so I initially was disappointed because 
as a as a resident, I was very interested in uh, pursuing hypertensive nephropathy uh, as a research interest. He uh, his lab was uh, focused on acid base physiology, and so I of course pursued what his lab was pursuing, and I'm so glad that I yielded to what his lab was good at as opposed to my wanting to pursue my own individual interests in my very young and inexperienced age at the time. And so following his advice of learning a research approach in an area in which the lab was very good was um, um, was good advice to me, and it's something that I have benefited from uh, that uh, lesson uh, from the beginning. So that was very important to uh, for me to learn to focus on what the lab is good at in uh, where I am. The second point I've already alluded to, which again I have found very uh, uh, helpful, is making sure that in all of my pursuits going forward in pursuing even basic research, that I maintain the connection as to how that uh, fits in within the context of overall physiology and how that fits into the overall uh, clinical medicine. So my interest for many years has been the, the mechanisms for distal nephron acidification. And Dr. Kirschman always encouraged me to continue to look at that within the context of acid-based physiology in the kidney, and then with, even within the broader context of how that fits into uh, clinical medicine. And I think that has served me well in terms of now moving into what uh, uh, people are now calling translational research. So we've been able to move our research from the cells to the animals, and now we're applying the lessons that we learned in that very basic research into uh, experimental uh, uh, therapies for kidney protection. In short, uh, our interest has been in looking at the mechanisms by which the kidney alters its, uh, its acidification in response to systemic challenges, either acid systemic challenges or base systemic challenges to uh, systemic acid base status. And through that, we have made some connections to how uh, a kidney function declines with time in folks who have underlying kidney diseases of various disorders. And that has led us to some dietary interventions that we think are kidney protective. And we have uh, preliminary evidence to su uh, suggest that certain dietary interventions are kidney protective in patients who have less than normal uh, GFR. And I can loop all of that back to uh, Dr. Kurtzman's mentorship uh, 35 years ago, saying that, that as I pursued even the basic uh, aspects of our uh, research, that I continue to connect that to whole kidney, uh, whole kidney function and connect that in turn to uh, to the care of patients and how that might relate to what we clinicians do to make patients with kidney disease better. Wonderful. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that that's that's a summary of about thirty five years of research. <laughs> um, it sounds like that mentorship has really been um, it has has been central to you. It's, it's, it really always seems to me that that, that uh, mentorship um, is, is essential for anybody's success. Absolutely, is. and 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 mentorship certainly in the tools that you described, and mentorship um, in the thinking as to how to approach your science, at which you described it very well. But I would also say mentorship in recognizing our. Um, our obligation to medicine and to our patients to make sure that the resources that we are expending, not just the dollars, but the time and the effort that comes from the, 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 the people with whom we work, that those resources provide returns uh, to our patients because ultimately 
that's what the research is about. It's about helping our patients. Yes, it helps our scientific careers along the line. Yes, it does push um, the envelope with respect to our knowledge of these science principles. All of that you and I are very excited about. But ultimately, we want to translate all of that into how we make our uh, patients better. And again, that's a lesson that I learned uh, long, long ago, uh, most notably from uh, Dr. Kurtzman in his mentorship of me. And I see that that is already developing in you to make that translation from the, uh, the science uh, in the laboratory to the physiology overall, to the care of patients, and then to the benefit of medicine overall. You've already got a great foundation for that going forward, and I encourage that to continue and that you pass it on to others who will learn from you. And that, when, that makes me very excited to be able to do is, is pass on that knowledge. It, 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 it gives me that connection, I think, with, uh, with my mentors is, is that I'm passing down something that, that they've given to me. Absolutely, and it also gives you a guidepost as to what you want to learn from your mentors going, going forward. I, I, I remember when I started my fellowship, um, I didn't know very much what I needed to know. I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't know what I needed to know, and Dr. Kirschman was very helpful in filling in those blanks. These are the things that you need to know. These are the skills that you need to develop. These are the targets that you need to shoot for, not just in your individual career, but in your contribution to nephrology and medicine overall. And that's something now that has guided me and my mentorship of others who uh, have worked in our lab over the years and, and even our collaborators who work with us right now. I, I remember some of the, clinically, some of the same kinds of experiences as um, uh, Dr. Seifter was one of my clinical mentors as, as a general nephrology fellow, and, and he's just one of the most brilliant people I've ever worked with uh, in, with regards to fluids and electrolytes and acid-based physiology. And um, he would, and, and we, would, we would have long conversations about managing hyponatremia and, and acid-based disturbances, and then and in assessing electrolyte-free water clearance in patients with uh, with SIADH, and those are the same things that 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 in general nephrology fellowship I had no idea that that's what I needed to know, and he really helped to create those guideposts for me, and they were things that then I could go on and and read about, but he gave me sort of the the, the guideposts and the, the the roadmap of sort of the important things I needed to think about, and then when I, we'd come back and talk through cases and and particularly coming back as a transplant nephrology fellow when we work with the general nephrology fellows. Um, it's, it's really fun to be able to, um, to echo some of what he's taught me with our, with our general nephrology fellows. Well, I like your description of it as it being guideposts. I think that that is very apt because certainly we as individuals, and you have demonstrated this thus far, we work very hard in what we do, but it is very nice to have guides uh, for that work such that the work uh, and the hard effort that we put into our careers uh, yields benefits because we've been guided in where the work should go, where we should focus, and the, uh, the mileposts of returns that we should look for down the road. So I, I think you, you've already uh, gotten some good guideposts that you can follow for the rest of your career. The ASM Foundation for Kidney Research commits more than $3 million every year to support cutting-edge studies that fuel today's innovations and tomorrow's cures. The ASM Foundation encourages you to learn more about its grants program and how you might participate by visiting the ASM website at www.asn-online.org grants.